Good evening, everyone. It's great to see such a full house here tonight to hear Kirsten's manta ray conservation story. I'm Elizabeth Stevenson, and I work here in the Conservation Department, New England Aquarium, and I coordinate the Marine Conservation Action Fund. So it's a great pleasure not only to share Kirsten's work with you tonight, but to have a chance to tell you a little bit about this wonderful program of the aquariums that we call MCAF. MCAF is a granting program of the aquarium that has funded not only Kirsten's work, but over 100 projects in 37 countries on six continents since 1999. And MCAF exists because of the aquarium's strong commitment to ocean conservation. And it enables the aquarium to connect with researchers and conservationists all over the world who share that same dedication and commitment to protecting the oceans. People such as Rohan Arthur, who is working to study the impact of climate change on coral reefs in the Indian Ocean. He used his MCAF grant to purchase a portable air compressor that enabled him to dive on the remotest islands of this island chain and to assess the impact of coral bleaching there. People such as Ruth Leaney, who is our most recently funded project, who is going to be studying, identifying, and documenting the, what, is, what may be the last remaining sawfish in Mozambique. And people such as Didier Chacon, who many of you may have seen in his lecture when he came here last August, who with teams of conservationists and biologists and volunteers goes out every night during the turtle nesting season on um, the beaches of Costa Rica to protect nesting sea turtles and their eggs from poachers and predators, saving thousands and thousands of tiny sea turtle hatchlings every year. We had the great pleasure, as we are with Kirsten, we had the great pleasure of hosting Didier Chacon here at the aquarium where he was able to connect with our own sea turtle rescuers and rehabilitators at our animal care facility in Quincy. We have, MEMCAF has also supported our own aquarium rescue and rehab staff as they have worked to save penguins affected by an oil spill in South Africa or to attend to cold stranded turtles here in New England and also in Florida. And we've also supported research at the aquarium to develop better ways to improve treatment for injured animals. So all of this would not be possible, with, oh, first I want to say, sorry. Um, what's wonderful about having MCAF here at the aquarium is events like this tonight with you, is that the aquarium a, presents a great platform for sharing these wonderful stories. There are so many more stories I could tell you of projects that MCAF has funded, <coughs> and I'm sure we will have more opportunities and more lectures to do that. But through our newsletter, through exhibits in the main building, through lectures like these, we have the opportunity to share these stories like Kirsten's. And in addition to that, Kirsten, when she was uh, yesterday, gave a wonderful workshop for our teen program, some of whom are here tonight. Um, uh, marine biologists in training, young, young people who are very interested in marine conservation. And we can tell you, but I think it was very inspiring for them to see Kirsten, who in her, her short years on the planet has already made such a great difference for marine conservation. There's so many um, more stories to share, but I want to get to Kirsten. So first, I would like to say um, MCAF would not be possible without our without our without the support of our donors, which include the Oak Foundation, the Curtis and Edith Munson Foundation, as well as generous generosity of individual donors. And MCAF would not exist without the support of our advisory committee. We have this wonderful team of scientists, international team of scientists and professionals who, who donate their time to review all our proposals that we receive. And we're extremely fortunate to have three of our founding committee members here tonight. Um, Alan Diner, raise your hand. Alan Diner and Greg Stone, who was with the aquarium for a number of years and is now with Conservation International. And Heather Tausig, who has the conservation department here and works closely with me on MCAF. And John Mandelman in the back is our director of research and our, one of our newest members, but has been very instrumental in reviewing the shark and ray proposals that we have received, including that that uh, Kirsten submitted to us. So, <laughs> Kirsten Forsberg. Kirsten Forsberg is a conservation biologist and social entrepreneur who specializes in engaging local communities in marine conservation. Shortly after graduating from college, Kirsten founded her own sea turtle protection organization and managed to recruit 100 local volunteers within the first month. 
This organization became the seed for what is now Planeta Oceano, or Planet Ocean, an organization that she co-founded and now directs. In a few short years, Kirsten has spearheaded numerous research and community conservation efforts and has contributed to policy initiatives such as the Convention on Migratory Species and the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species. She has been awarded with numerous fellowships and many awards, including being named as one of Forbes 30 Under 30 Social Entrepreneurs and the World Wildlife Fund International President's Award for Conservation. She also serves on the World Economic Forum as a world, um, as a global shaper. And I give to you Kristen Forsberg. everyone thank you so much for being here thank you Elizabeth just <laughs> away. and thank you so much for, for the opportunity of having me here really I'm, I'm really excited to show to share with you what we've been researching in Peru and this is a project a manta ray project that we're doing in Planet Oceano in collaboration with other organizations such as Wild Aid and Shark Savers so um, before I get to talk to you a bit about our project I wanted to tell you a bit about who I am and what Planet Oceano is and how all this got started and like Elizabeth said when I was studying my undergrad um, biology degree I decided to do a lot of volunteering work and one of this volunteering work led me to an incredible organization called Brilhito da Mar in Brazil and I worked with sea turtles and I just fell in love with sea turtles and I said I want to do something with sea turtles in my country so that's how I went back to Peru it was the year 2007 and I decided to go to northern Peru to study strandings and bycatch of endangered sea turtles. In Peru we have five out of the seven species of sea turtles and four of them we found um, stranding and also in, in bycatch. And one of the things that was most impacting for me, apart from the fact that we found over 260 dead sea turtles in, in over a year stranded in the beaches, was the fact that, like Elizabeth said, in one month we had 100 volunteers. And this whole community uh, project grew, and suddenly we were the Sea Turtle Project people. And so that, that grew into what today is Planet Oceano. So basically, Planet Oceano is a nonprofit organization that works in marine conservation, but by engaging local communities. So it was just as the platform that we started with the Sea Turtle Project but we work in numerous different projects and I'm going to tell you a bit about them. Uh, so we work in research projects. Basically our research projects is, are on, on species, on environments, on social research, but it's basically engaging citizens as scientists. That anybody can be a scientist and anybody can take information that can lead into management. Our marine education programs incorporate um, marine issues, which was something totally unexistent in Peru. So we're including um, marine topics, but not just by workshops or by teaching kids, it's by restructuring the whole educational system. It's by networking teachers, by integrating schools, by introducing uh, education in a fun and participatory way that can actually change the whole concept of, of education in the country. And finally, our third pillar is sustainable development, in which we not only incorporate new alternate economic income, for example, through ecotourism for the communities, but we're also engaging local entrepreneurs and we're fostering um, stakeholder engagement since the very beginning of our projects. So those are our main three uh, pillars of, of action. and. Like Elizabeth said, this has luckily got some recognition uh, across the world. Um, this is one of my favorites, um, in which not only we won the, the National Environmental Citizenship Award, but one of our schools did. So that kind of, one of the schools in our, in our network. So that kind of shows what we think about. We're not about the organizing and promoter organization. We're rather an organization that works together with the community hand in hand and they are also the leaders and the winners of, of each of the conservation actions. So, this is our ultimate goal. Um, we are planet ocean. We all depend on the ocean. When we breathe, we're breathing in oxygen that's supplied by the ocean. 
Um, and how we do in order to conserve it is not just working on an ecosystem-based level, but also working with flagship species. And that takes us back to the manta rays today. Um, so, mantas. Mantas and mobulus, uh, like I said, I started working with sea turtles, and then I started working with mantas, and now it's just a fascinating species that is evolving and, and, and getting each more time I'm getting more passionate with. Um, but anyway, just to share some brief characteristics on the mantas. Uh, they're cartilaginous fish, they're very migratory, which means that we need joint conservation efforts between different countries. Uh, they feed on plankton and they have a very low reproductive rate, which means that they have just one pup, so it's just one pup each two to three years maybe, so it means that conservation for these species are very um, necessary and, and extraction is not very sustainable. Uh, why they're important? They're important because of many things, but primarily they're an indicator because of their biological characteristics, an indicator of ocean health. They are marvelous flagship species, incredibly charismatic, and not just because of that, they, are, they can be like leaders in conservation, but also generate tourism attraction that can as well help lots of communities um, through different uh, initiatives and help livelihoods in low-income countries such as Peru. So just to have a brief difference, when I talk about mobulids, I'm gonna start talking about mobulids from now on. And mobulids basically encompass these two friends of mine, which are the manta rays um, and the mobula rays. So manta, which is manta virostris, which is the one we have, uh, is the giant manta ray. And the difference between that and the mobulas, we have four different species of mobulas in Peru, um, is first of all the mouth. So here the mouth is just like central and front in between these two cephalic fins. And in the mobulas, it's ventral, so it's just like on the bottom. Uh, also, the mantas have a wide head, and the mobulas have a narrow head, and the cephalic fins in the mobulas are like pointing up, and in the mantas they're pointing inward. So that's kind of the different morphological characteristics of them both. Um, they are different species, they have different uh, characteristics, and therefore they have to be managed differently, but they do have many things in common, like the low reproductive rates that I have been talking about. So they are both uh, equally important to concern. So taking that into account, uh, I wanted to tell you a bit about our story with Matt and how we started with, with all this. And it actually doesn't start with me, it starts uh, with researchers in Ecuador. So in the year 2010 approximately, there were some researchers in Ecuador um, directed by and, and with a project team led by Dr. Andrea Marshall and they were studying manta rays and migration of manta rays in, in Ecuador. Now Ecuador and then we soon came to know Peru as well, this population in the East Pacific is one of the most important in the world. Uh, it's one of the largest as well. So Andrea was tagging mantas to know where they were migrating to. And she tagged a marvelous manta called Humboldt. And Humboldt started swimming. And so he swam and he swam until he got to Peru. And so that's how we noticed that there was a migratory pattern and corridor between Ecuador and Peru. Um, the thing was that while Humboldt was in Peru, his tag fell off. And so that's when Andrea and her team started a large campaign on Facebook. So thank you, Facebook. <laughs> uh, there was this large campaign on Facebook and saying, please, if anyone finds our tag, could you please give it back to us? So marvelously, this got to me and we said, okay, we'll help. So we work in northern Peru from some time now and we can do that. We just started pasting together with the community these signs saying, if anybody finds this device, please help us find it. Um, it was just basically because we wanted to help in, in, in this manta ray conservation project which we found was completely exciting. So the interesting thing was this was like a thing this big and it was like finding a needle in a haystack, it was in a whole region, it could have been sunk in the middle of the ocean or, or standing somewhere until one day we got a phone call 
and they said, we found your tag. Okay. So uh, it was incredible, and we met with the fisherman, which is here, and he has tag. So there was a reward, and her team were giving a reward, um, and we exchanged the reward for the device. Um, unfortunately, we wanted to have a press conference and for the wider community to notice about this, but the fisherman said that he didn't want anybody to notice it because he didn't want his wife to find out that he had money. <laughs> that was the story. But the cool thing out of this was that um, it gave us a reason to think that we were in an area that had an important mantle population and that there was a lot of things to do and that we didn't know anything, anything about the mantle. So in order to conserve them, we had to start learning a bit about them. And especially because it is a species that has been present in Peruvian culture. Like this, these are Inca, pre-Inca art crafts. And you can notice that mobiles have been present since uh, uh, ancient Peruvian times. Mobulids are also present in Peruvian food. So in dishes such as chiringuito, uh, chingirito and tortilla de raya, um, which different rays are involved, mobulids are also consumed for that. So we're thinking it, we're such a part of this important population, we're consuming the rays. Uh, like rays are part of the Peruvian culture and we don't know anything about them. So that's how it started. And we just started interviewing fishermen. Um, this was in the year like 2010, in initial 2011. And we interviewed the fishermen and we started to get really amazing information that indeed um, there was a, a, a big capture of mantas. And so the first photo that we got was this one. Um, and it was of a fisherman that was always in charge of going out and harpooning the mantas. And he told us, um, I would like to get involved in your project because each time that I go out and each time that I capture a manta, it has a baby inside. So uh, I want to know. And so we were thinking, wow, we're probably talking about a reproductive area for these um, species. So with all this in mind, we finally got our project up and going. And that's how we started working with the Muppets. So we had these three main questions in mind. First of all, what the distribution and the characteristics of, of the population, not only of the mantas, but of the mobulas were. Um, what size were they? Where were they living? Uh, what time of years were they? We didn't even know this information. How was the situation of the fisheries at that time? Like how much was being fished? Where were they fishing? Um, and also after the species were captured, uh, what was happening with this meat? Um, was there also a, a commerce of gill rakers like there is in other countries or was it only uh, consumption of meat? So having these questions in mind, we decided on working in two specific areas of, of Peru. So this is my country here. And Tumbes, which is northern Peru, bordering Ecuador. This is where we did basically all our fisheries research um, and landing research. And then most of the meat here is, is transported into Chiclayo, because this is the place where um, most of the dishes from Ray come. So we decided on studying these two areas. So this is just a brief account of in Tumbes, where we did the, the fisheries work. We went to different communities, and also the other region of Buda, which is south to Tumbes, we worked in different communities. So it was not just one community, we tried to monitor as much as we could. Um, so what we did in these places is basically go out and survey landings, and so we measured the individuals, it, um, both body length and disc width. And we also measured other things, like where was the individual coming from? Where was it, when was it taken? Um, did it have um, a pup inside or not? So lots of different things that went into these field sheets. And these field sheets were uh, filled out by fishermen themselves. So our project coordinator is an artisanal fisherman. Then we did onboard observations. Um, and this is a really lovely manta that's jumping out of Peruvian waters. Uh, so what we did was not only go out ourselves as the project team and our local field coordinator, 
but also go out um, and have fishermen start reporting. So have indirect reports and for us the fishermen are true experts so we can learn a lot from them and they can identify when these species are, are coming out and, and from there get really valuable information. So once we did that we went down to Chiclayo which is the place where I said that um, most of the consumption is going on. And there what we did is we went and monitored the terminal where all this meat is coming to, and then where it is being processed, which is mainly here in San Jose. And from there, to the markets in red, and to the restaurants, we measured some restaurants in, in the market. Additionally, we, we also took other stuff, such as tissue, brain, um, stomach contact, content, and the spine tail. Uh, not to work with initially, but to have samples so that we can study in the near future. So what we found out, um, and what we found out for me is, is very exciting, and sorry if I have a bit too much statistics, I try to keep it simple. <laughs> but I just want you to keep in mind that um, some of the information that we're going to give out, maybe you don't, maybe initially you'll think it's not that relevant, but everything is relevant if we don't know anything. So we're starting to know where they're at, what, and depending on all this information, how uh, we can manage the species. So for mantas, we figured out that there is a large fishery. Um, even though it's not huge, the numbers are significant enough um, to show them that it is something that we should be worrying about. So in the months of the project, uh, from, I think it's, I'm gonna, go later on, I think it was from June to August, I'll, I'll, it was a few months of the project, um, one year, we found seven individuals. From these seven individuals, three of them were pregnant, so there was a high percentage rate, and the other one was a juvenile. So we are talking about a place, uh, and we are confirming that it is a place where it is important for reproduction of the mantas. And this was um, in different uh, landing points of the Dubas region. So this was the pup, this is the pregnant mom, and basically what they do is they fish it out uh, and once they get the pup out, the pup is more meat. So they just chop up the mom and chop up the pup. So uh, these are the months, <laughs> from August 2012 to July 2013, that's where we got all these individuals and like you see, uh, they are basically present all year round. We found these peaks, but um, we still need more more research to do to see if these peaks are, are actually significant. Um, we do find them all year round. These arrows here show the different months in which we found the pregnant females. So these spots here, this is the Tumbes region, and these are the places where we saw the mantas, those mantas jumping up and high, and these places here are the places where the fishermen saw the mantas. So initially we didn't even know where they were, now we know where they are, they're kind of here. Uh, so this is like a large aggregation zone in general, um, and this coincides with four main fishery areas in the region. So there is an interaction between the mantas and the fisheries. Uh, but if we would say where the main ones are, we'd say probably here, where we found two pregnant mantas captured, and also <coughs> probably here, where we found one pregnant manta captured. So that's a good idea of now we know if we wanted to go and study them, or we want to go and have ecotourism with the fishermen. We already know where to go. So how were they captured? Uh, most were incidental. Um, four were incidental. Uh, three of them caught in Persine and one in the gill net, so basically in Persine. But also three of them were harpooned, like incident, like intentional. So it's not just um, one or the other. We have the two big problems. <laughs> And this here is what happens, so they go and they consume the meat. <laughs> Sorry, my baby. <laughs> she also wants to listen. <laughs> uh, okay, so they, they consume the meat and basically what happens is the gill rakers that we were wondering, are they being consumed, are they being eaten? Well, no, fortunately. Uh, most of the part that's not meat is brought to this 
uh, really modern uh, incineration site and they're just incinerated. So luckily we don't have a uh, guild trade but it's not far away from having it. Like if people someday, I hope this is not online and then people will want to <laughs> start selling the guild leaders. Um, anyway, so there is, there is this, this chance that maybe someday the international trade might come. So that was the mantas in northern Peru, and then the mobulas have a similar problem. It's a bit different. What we found out is we do have the four species of mantas. So it's uh, Japanica, Mugiana, Rusoni, and Tarapacana. The four of them were captured in Peruvian fisheries. This is really valuable information because until this date, the Peruvian government, when it goes out and it assesses uh, mobulid fisheries, to date it just assessed as mobulus. So you can't just package four different species as one. Um, so now we're identifying when different species are being captured. So in total we have like 41 tons um, are this part of the project from August to May 2013. Uh, also basically present throughout the study site. These two huge peaks here, possibly um, Mobula Tarapacana, and what we think is that a large school was coming in and at that time they just captured everything. So we're not sure if it's Tarapacana or not because it's something that the fishermen told us. We didn't get a chance to see photographs, so why don't we just eliminate that? And we go to what we are sure, which are these individuals here, and we see that this is kind of the area where we see a peak in mobulus and our five mobula thurstoni were only reported in April and we have them in different coastal communities but these three here, Mancora, Capulco and Sorritos, basically Mancora, is the most important port for mobula landings. So um, once we know that, we know how to approach the mobula fisheries. Like I said, basically Japanica uh, which was before not even identified. Uh, followed by Mungiana, which is a really cool species, which was recently described, I think it was in the 80s, uh, and it's, it's a very restricted as well um, to this kind of region, and Mobula Thurston. So as well, in gillnets, both of these basically in gillnets, and Mungiana in gillnets and so then what we did is, okay, we know when they're being captured, we know uh, how they're being captured, who are they being captured with? Because that can help us target the fisheries. Um, so we, uh, for both Japanica, which is the most common, and Gana, we assessed what they were being captured with. And these two here, both tuna and mahi-mahi, are highly so we definitely have to work with these fisheries if we want to work um, with the mobula problem. Now the thing is, mobulas, uh, just like mantas, if they're being caught, it's not that fishermen want to go and capture the mobulas or capture the mantas. They probably want to go capture these guys. But if these guys aren't around, we might as well capture mobulas and mantas. So it's not the most uh, priority resource, but if it's there, then they will capture it. So as for mobulus, we went and we asked the fishermen, where are you capturing them? So based out of interviews, we uh, know that mm. mobula mungiana is kind of there, Japanica is a bit further away, and is sharing with the study. So now we kind of know where to go and find the species. <laughs> now here comes the really worrying part, because what is being captured? And I usually, when I start my, my workshops with kids, I ask, who likes seafood? And everybody's like raising their hand. Um, and then, who knows if the seafood that you're eating is an adult? The, nobody knows. And I ask you guys here, like, when you guys eat seafood, do you know if it's an adult? No. <laughs> so that's the same problem that's happening with the mobulus. And in the mobulus, luckily, Munkiana in northern Peru, they were all above uh, the length of maturity. So uh, this is according to literature. 
of what is when it gets um, old enough to reproduce, but Tabanica was 60% were immature. And there's Sony, all of the individuals that were found were immature. So we're basing a fishery on immature individuals. And the weird thing here is that usually Dorsoni is smaller than Munchiana, so Munchiana is usually larger, but here it was the other way around. So it, we're talking about a fishery that's not um, very sustainable. We found some stuff for Munchiana, which is really exciting because Munchiana, like I said, it's a, it's a species that was just recently described. So knowing anything, like any little thing of it, is really exciting information. And we just started relating different indicators that we got. And we noticed that the larger Munchianas, the larger individuals, were captured more towards October. And as we, as we went towards January, they started decreasing. Also, further north they were larger, and as they started going down, they started getting smaller in size. And also, the larger ones were captured in the gill nets, and the smaller ones were captured in the perceives. So, this information is not enough to say it's truly significant, but it does give us certain insights on the species that are not only valuable for Peru, but in general for the East Pacific. So, we have these fisheries, we get the individuals out of the water, and then where do they go to? Um, most of them go to the Santa Rosa terminal in Chiclayo, where I said where the, all the tortilla de raya is going on. And another part goes to the Tumbes Market. This is an area that we're currently studying, but we already studied the Santa Rosa terminal, and that's what I wanted to share with you. So we went down to Santa Rosa. And what happened? So basically, the individuals are being captured and are being taken to Santa Rosa. This is a mobula um, with its embryo. It's probable that when it was captured, it was forced to abort. Um, so we're definitely taking out the juveniles and the pregnant um, individuals. Um, the ones that come complete to Chiclayo are usually, usually the smallest individuals the largest individuals will just come chopped up. Uh, so it's more difficult to see what's going on um, with these species here. But in some cases we can, like in the case of the mantas, because they have a really rough skin. So if you see a, a manta chopped up, then you can see it's this rough skin here. So we also had a significant amount of landings to to Chiclayo, so it's basically what happens is they're fished in northern Peru and then they're just put into trucks and they're taken to this area and this serves kind of like a hub, so it has uh, truck loads coming from northern Peru from our first study site and also from other parts of the country. It's there all year round but it has its peaks as well. But like I said, it's coming from different parts of the country. The only part that's kind of really far away is here at Chimbote, but most of it, most, most of the mobiles are coming from up here. And from there, the highest landing point is Manquada, which is just the place that we studied. And then again, what we want to do is corroborate if what we were seeing in Manquada was kind of the trend in, in general, and, and it is. Um, most of them are Japanica, followed by Mugiana. And again, the sizes. Um, what happens here is we had from 118 complete individuals, Mobula Munchiana that used to have none under this uh, maturity age. Here we had 33. And in Chiclayo, we had 100% of the Japanicas that were immature and 100% of the third zones that were immature. So uh, we're talking about a serious problem here. Uh, it, this is Probably because, like I said, the largest individuals already came chopped up. So we're just measuring the small ones, but still, we are having a large uh, fishery of juveniles. So how are they being consumed? Um, what happens is they come to Santa Rosa, and that's the place that I've shown you just right now the photos about, and then they go to San Jose, which is where they're going to be processed. And from there, they go to the different markets. Um, across the region and also to the restaurants. So this is kind of the processing of it all. 
Uh, these photos are taken in Santa Rosa. They are basically coming from northern Peru. They're weighed. They are bought by somebody. And usually they put these marks. These are like your initials. So if you're going to buy these fish, they call, um, they'll just mark it um, with their signature. And then they'll take it in one of these trucks to San Jose. So it's, it's not very hygienic. Uh, then once it gets to San Jose, it's processed artisanally. Uh, the skin is taken off. It's put into buckets. In these buckets, uh, the excess of blood is drained out. And once that happens, it's put with salt. And once that happens, it's put out to dry. So most of the meat of the mobulids are consumed as dry meat because this, like I said, this comes back to pre-Inca cultures. It, it was a way for pre-Inca cultures to take the meat to the Andes without it getting spoiled. So we're drying the meat up and taking it far away. Now, what's the conservation problem of doing this? It's that after process, the meat loses 70% to 80% of its weight in water. So if you want to have if you have a piece of meat like this of mobulas and you dry it up, it'll be like this. So obviously you need much more mobula meat in order to get full and therefore you need to consume and capture much more mobulas. Then it goes to the markets in which it's uh, basically consumed by the general public. Uh, although it, it's also consumed by the restaurants and we then went to the restaurants and ask the restaurants, do you sell mobulids? And of course they do. Um, most of the restaurants throughout the, this region are selling mobulids. So they don't know about the mantas, they don't know about the mobulids, they don't know about the low reproductive rate. Um, it's just something that is tradition that the people are eating. So then going to the prices, we kind of followed it through, uh, and it's the fishermen are not getting too much out of these mantas. We're talking about the mantas are, are cost much less. It's per kilo about 33 cents. Uh, the mobulas are a bit more. Then they go to Santa Rosa, in which if they sell to the general public, they'll increase it a bit. Um, and then they go to San Jose, which also this is like in high quantities, so that's why the price is less. In San Jose, they'll sell it in a package of 12 kilos, approximately, and a package of Manta meat of 12 kilos will cost you $2. Uh, from the markets, it will go to the restaurants, dry, and will be approximately $4 uh, per kilo. And then in the restaurants, you can get a dish ranging from $3 to $5 um, of manta meat. So, our ultimate goal after finding all this thing out is how can we start conserving and, and protecting these species? Uh, but first of all, if we want to protect them, we can't deny that there are people that are depending on them. Uh, so how much do the people depend on these resources? And so we did surveys. And we noticed that as for dependence, people, even fishermen, don't depend much on mantas. Uh, and they don't rely much on them. They basically go out and fish other things. And if they see a manta, they'll capture it. But there is a very low dependence and reliability for the mantas. That is a bit uh, different in mobulus. Despite it still isn't very high, both the dependence and the reliability of mobula meat for fishermen and for the general public is intermediate and a bit higher. So that makes uh, protection and conservation of mobula is a bit more difficult. So in conclusion, and just to round off, uh, mantas, that's a pup, it's cute. <laughs> um, this is a very important area for mantas. It is a very important area and, and we had never uh, thought about it. I was, I was telling some students early, earlier today, like, even initially, I myself didn't even think that it was going to be such an important area. It's a, a crucial area for manta conservation, not only in the East Pacific, but in the world. Um, we are in front of a very worrying behavior. We are capturing pregnant mantas and juveniles. 
and this is not only a very worrying behavior but it's also providing insights that this is a great reproduction area and a potential reproduction area for these species. We already identified the aggregation zones. Um, so we have possible aggregation zones which coincide with four main fishery uh, areas. And knowing this, it's much more easier for us to go out and study them more or do ecotourism amongst other things. Definitely incidental capture in Perseids is most common, but we can't um, deny that they are also harpooning them, for example. And there is a low dependence and low reliability on these species, so it's much easier to protect them and to have fishermen support um, because they are not the primary source of income. As for mobulus, the thing is a bit different. There is a larger commercialization. But little is known. Like for a long time, we've been capturing them, consuming them, but we didn't know anything. We didn't even know that we were consuming juveniles. And that is true. Like Mobula japanica is the most common, even though it wasn't even mentioned before. Um, and of these, 60% were juveniles, and 100% of the Thursoni were juveniles. We now have a bit of insights on Mobula munkiana, which is very exciting because, like I said, it's a newly discovered species, um, so we're, we're having the opportunity to study it a bit more. Mancora, like I said, is the most important area. We kind of know where they are as well. And most of the landings that are coming in are processed. So like I said, this is a very important conservation challenge because dried meat over stimulates the overexploitation. So if we could try to combat that, but then again, it's a cultural thing. And we know they're present all year long, although they are most frequently found in summer. And in this case, although not very high, there is a higher dependence and reliability um, and for income for the fishermen. So what do we need to do? Um, in my case, I, I studied biology and I love research and I love going out and taking data and information, but for me, having information, that's not enough. Like you really need to do something else and, and it would be very sad to have this information and not use it. So what we did next was have this proposal and we already sent this proposal to the Peruvian government and to the different Peruvian stakeholders which we're currently meeting with um, in order to have the mantas and the mobulus protected. We, previous to this, we had workshops with artisanal fishermen in which they signed the commitment in order to help us protect the mantas and the mantas. Uh, so we're waiting for the authorities' decision for that, but I'm extremely excited because it's a project that has taken us uh, basically since last year, so a year and a year and a half, and we already have this document going. We couple this together with awareness because policy is not enough. You have to give awareness and outreach. So we did these different um, signs that went out to the community but again, signs are not enough. You have to engage people. <coughs> and that's how we empowered you. So we had over two, 24 workshops with students throughout our project and trained over 200 students. Now the cool thing here was that it's not just teaching them, but it's empowering them to spread the word. So most of the data that I've shown today, um, specifically in the Chiclayo area, have been taken by students themselves. So it's young people that are going out and that are surveying and that are providing information at, for conservation actions in their community. And where they have reached over 500 people. And finally, what we're on now is how to develop ecotourism. And how can we engage fishermen in order to not only have the policy side and the research side and the education side, but like in the sustainable development side that I said, in which we can have fishermen that are clearly gaining more than 33 cents uh, per kilo of manta, in which we can have uh, sustainable livelihoods that can actually value these species. So we have our first expeditions that are going out in January. You're all invited. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm just representing a whole team that has been working on this since the very beginning not only the collaboration with Wild Data and the Manta Trust, but also of the whole Planet Oceano team, of Jose and Stephanie, which are our, our main uh, field biologists, uh, of the fishermen, of our field coordinator, which is Wilmer, which 
uh, was really excited at each time he came over and he said, you know, Kirsten, the fishermen are calling me now and before they used to say, oh, it just I found mantas. And now they can recognize a manta from a mobulan. And he was so excited with that. So um, this, is, is, this is great because we're actually transforming how the community is, is thinking and, and acting. Um, and our international volunteers and our local volunteers and, and we're just all a part of this like, huge planet ocean. So I invite you to be part of it as well and we have this Facebook. And please feel free to contact me if you need anything. So thank you. It's a very complex situation. <laughs> so, um, our ultimate goal is try to make the whole fishery more sustainable in general, um, not just of the mantas, but of everything that's working in Northern Peru. That, as you know, will take a long time. So, initially, we're starting with combating that, like we said, it's incidental and intentional, right? Like, our first step is intentional, um, and then we'll also start thinking about incidental. but. These, this kind of research gives us a, a great first step in order to say, okay, we have to start targeting these type of fisheries and, and these areas. So, so yeah, that is definitely something that we have to think about. Um, but the project has just been running like, for a year and a half. So um, I think we can, we can start seeing that soon. Yeah. Yes. What do you learn from the other regions that have tried to do uh, economic alternatives? You mentioned that you're starting to network with other organizations. What have they been telling you about finding economic alternatives for the uh, person? Because not, some people do have the fish, you can't convert every fish yeah. you know, in the water into this. No. We definitely, I'm not thinking that we're going to convert them from being fishermen because I don't think that you have to change the livelihoods. Like, we also want to value what artisanal fishermen are doing. Um, I think this would just be like an additional uh, thing in order for them to show sustainable fishery activities. Uh, worldwide, I think ecotourism has provided as a, a relatively good source of income and we have Mary that's around here uh, <laughs> that works with us and I think she can give um, more insights because she's done a lot of work on, on the ecotourism part and how it, it does really impact. Um, so, so we are very confident that there will be a high impact, but we don't want to leave uh, fishermen from fishing. Yes. How open is the Peruvian government to creating um, like laws that will help protect? Um, so it's not the most open government that you will find, but it's not that difficult. So while we were working on the project, for example, we, we had the opportunity to present our information uh, for the Peruvian government to support uh, both the CMS, the Convention for Migratory Species, and also CITES. And with our information, they found it valuable and they could take the decision to support the inclusion of, of mantas for these two conventions. So they are willing to receive information in order for management. And while we have presented the proposal until today, they are interested. We just have to keep on pushing. Yeah. Um, actually, two questions. First one is, uh, how hard was it to uh, approach and talk to the fishermen? And is it harder now, now that they know what you're doing? The second question would be, um, even though the price of the food suggests not, but are they, is there a lot of people hunting for? I, don't, I just have to eat today. I mean, is there a long... Okay, so uh, 
the first question of how easy was it? We already came from working with fishermen and working with the local communities before because we had been working since 2007, which was relatively <coughs> new, but we already had this community-based approach, so we already knew the fishermen. Um, also, something that was very important was having our project coordinator was a fisherman. Was a, he is an artisanal fisherman, so it's just like speaking the same language. He was just going up to his friends and, and asking for information and inviting them to join. And, and thirdly, when we speak with fishermen, um, I, I usually say that we, we don't uh, go up to them and say, hey, we want to conserve mantas, we want to teach you about them. It's the other way around. It's what do you know about the mantas and how can we work together for this? So it's, it's more listening from them. So I think that approach always gets a lot of, of interest and, and participation. And Finally, how much do they consume? There's not a lot of fishermen that are fishing the mantas, uh, because like I said, it's, it's just like, if they see one and they go out and they don't find another species and they'll get it, um, it's not a huge population of fishermen. But the, the dishes, these tortilla de raya, they are very popular. Uh, now the thing is that uh, they are only popular in that area, and the thing is that not they don't only include mobulin, mobulin meat, but they include other rays. So erasing the mobulids from their diet won't be a problem. Obviously that could have an impact on other rays, so that makes the situation a bit more complex. Yes. We're just, we're able to outline certain areas where we have aggregations of the pregnant females and the juveniles. Is it conceivable that you could establish sanctuaries where fishing is not going to be exactly that, and that's the that's the really interesting thing of knowing where they are because now we can know where we have to protect them. Um, in, what I think is that in order to establish the sanctuary, we need to have total public participation in it, and we need the government to notice that the community is getting, for example, an income out of it. So if we partner, and that's why we're doing it together with outreach and the ecotourism component, because if we have those two things running and going, it's much easier to get a, a local MPA, for example, established. But yeah, that would be the ultimate dream. One more question? Um, I'm just curious, Peru is a huge fishery for sardines. Um, that's more commercial, and then you haven't talked much about, you've talked a lot about the local fishermen, but I was wondering if there's, uh, you're looking at commercial fisheries in there. So, yeah, that's a, a, that's a good question. So, most of the commercial fisheries go along the Humboldt Current, which is, it's basically the whole country, and the area that we're, we're working at, which is the one that I showed, is basically the Equatorial Current, which is a, like a different ecosystem, and that doesn't have the the main anchoveta or, or sardine industry there. Uh, however, in Chimbote, which was one of the, that when I showed the map, which is further south, there there is a large um, industrial fishing. So we'd have to check out a bit more of what's going on there. But until now, we know that basically it's, it's an interaction with the artisanal fishing. Okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Do you know about more countries or more areas that are consuming the, the mantas? The mantas or, and also, it's, it's, I'm sorry for this question, but I just want to know because when you put the light on them right now, don't you fear of, now people will be curious and say, oh, let's try this fish. I never tried it and it will start to be exotic. And the market might grow and the prices might get higher then, you know what I mean? Uh, so. I know that it's a bit tricky, but I just want to know. Okay, so there is, there are the countries that consume mantas, definitely. Um, Indonesia, for example, is one is a big country. And I think Indonesia's being, it's going to be protected, right? They're protecting the, the mantas currently in Indonesia. Uh, although basically there, although the meat is consumed, the gill rakers are the most important. Uh, as far as promoting consumption, the main issue that we did discuss and that we were worried about was the fact of, wow, what if we're promoting gill raker trade? And then, like, like I said, maybe yeah. if you're filming me right now, and don't go and consume the gill rakers. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe that. But that's why I think we have to act fast. 
and we have to protect them fast and we have to get outreach fast and and I'm very encouraged of how um, this project has turned out in, in such a low time period and I think that, that we can act relatively fast in order to combat that potential risk that could come. Oh, go ahead, go right ahead, yes. Oh, sorry. So, to say the truth, I don't know much about um, what's going on. Mary, do you know with more the, With the, the giant mantas, they don't have any predators. It would just be yeah. very large sharks or, or so, angling, and then the mobulas, sharks. Yeah. So, so basically, there's not much information like you're talking about of how interacting the species are interacting. There's not much information like we, I was talking about we didn't know anything about what was going on in Peru in general worldwide we don't know much about these species at all so there's still a lot to do on, on that field all right thank you very much Kirsten thank you.